What if I told you that in 1992, a visual thread connecting our cave dwelling ancestors to Hollywood's golden age was shattered by a single color? I believe we're in the middle of a digital revolution that's much bigger than the film to digital transition. One that gives us so much choice that we're often, myself included, making the wrong one. But fear not, for in researching this video, I have found peace and I've built a framework around choosing the right stupid LED. Hi, I'm Jesse. I'm a filmmaker and photographer and also a little bit of a curmudgeon because when I walk through my neighborhood at night and I see the choices people are making with their LEDs, I get a little bothered. And then I recently watched the original Blade Runner. It's where your brain goes to when you hear the word cyberpunk. When I compare Blade Runner to the lights I see around me in content and around the perimeter of young people's rooms, one feels timeless and rich and the other just feels cheap. We're at a point where we definitely have more, but it took me a lot of research to convince myself that more is better. And I can't help but notice the daylight LEDs people have in their homes. That relaxing blue glow makes you feel like you're at a bad job interview or possibly in a tanning bed. So relaxing. I love feeling like I'm at the dentist moments before I try to fall asleep. Christmas time fills me with a lot less joy these days, partially because I am a Grinch, but also because of the Christmas lights flickering as I drive by and mainlining saturation right directly into my eyeballs. Yes, I understand the environmental benefits of LEDs and I support them. My house is all LED. But I do think that certain LEDs could become even more energy efficient if they were just switched off. My mind drifts and thinks, what if, you know, similar to what you need to buy pesticides or dynamite, do you need a permit to buy an LED that is cooler than 4,000 Kelvin? I'll talk about Kelvin in a second. And yes, of course, I'm whining, but it does make me wonder why I hate certain LEDs so much. So we have to go back, way back before the LEDs were invented, back to pre-civilization, caveman times. Personally, I consider the time before I bought a Japanese-style bidet pre-civilization, but that's for another video. Pre-electricity, light was mainly the sun, and artificial light was fire. Torches, candles, oil lamps, all which emitted a warm orange glow. This warm light is the signature of home. It's linked to the moments before we go to sleep. And this warm glow carried through the electrical revolution into incandescent bulbs, which are just electricity passed through a tungsten filament, causing it to glow, and are the foundation of tungsten lights used for all of cinema's existence. The tungsten bulb gave us cinema's golden age. I remember the first time I stumbled into the physics of color temperature. Not to brag, but I was interviewing an actual Power Ranger and I brought my incandescent light kit with dimmers to set and I hooked them up to some lamps that were in the frame. And I was surprised to notice that as I dimmed the lights down, the incandescent bulbs, they got warmer and as I brightened them up, they got cleaner white, less warm. I remember this being my first practical demonstration of the Kelvin scale and truly understanding what it was. Kelvins are just another temperature scale, like Celsius or the extremely inferior Fahrenheit. I am just joking, but like all good jokes, they're rooted in truth. Back to Kelvins. Zero degrees Kelvin is the absolute zero we read about in space. So cold, all thermal movement stops at a molecular level. Like any temperature scale, move up the scale and things get hotter. Picture an iron ball getting heated. At a certain point, it starts to glow deep red, and then as it's heated more, it glows more white. You could say white hot. It's why tiny classic twinkle lights are so warm in color. Or think about a gas stove flame or a soldering torch and how as the flame burns cleaner and hotter, it turns blue. It's a bit confusing how the warmer the object gets thermally, the cooler it gets visually. From this point on, we'll just focus on the visual warmth of light. 
But what I love so much about the Kelvin scale is its deep human connection to us. We hunted and gathered under the clean light of the midday sun, and we shared meals and told stories lit by the light of a flame. As a kid, I would love it when the power went out and we lit candles for hoping the power would never come on. There's another really important aspect to incandescent light. It is full spectrum. When you look at the rainbow, you're getting a really helpful deconstruction of the components of visual light. If you laid out all of the colors the human eye can perceive on a chart, you get the classic 1931 hit, the International Commission on Illumination's Color Space Chart. And these are all of the colors that are available for you to see. Well, this is a representation of because you are seeing it on a screen. It's why photos never feel as vibrant as being there. We can also look at light in a graph based on its wavelength. If you superimpose midday sunlight over it, you can see that it's a beautiful full spectrum light. Full spectrum light gives our world color because it contains every color. When you see a green leaf, the red and blue parts of the color spectrum are being absorbed into the leaf, but the leaf is reflecting the green back to your eyes. That's why a lot of modern greenhouses use grow lights that look purplish. Why waste electricity shining green on the leaves shine more red and blue for it to do its photosynthesis. I think it's wild that plants literally need color to grow. Incandescents are full spectrum too. They push towards the warmer end of the scale, but look how nice and gentle this curve is. They cover the whole spectrum. So now we understand the spectrum and we know what the Kelvin scale feels like in the real world. Here's the Kelvin scale overlaid that CIE chart. Two things fundamentally subconsciously tied to our evolution. And that's why it's unsettling when we deviate, when we unmoor ourselves from these standards. When fluorescents were developed, they deviated from this scale and were described as sickly. When a human with an instinct for what another human looks like under full spectrum light along the Kelvin scale looked at another human under early fluorescent lights, a warning light went off that said, that person looks sick. These lights deviated in both Kelvin and spectrum. Many fluorescents emit a bare minimum of wavelength coverage. Spikes in the blue, green, and red mixed together give a barely passable facsimile of natural light. But with missing gaps between uneven spikes, it meant that colorful objects often look duller and greener under this low quality lighting than they would in daylight. This includes the human face, which if you're a photographer or a retoucher, you know that the human face reflects every light of the rainbow. This is where we started to pay attention to a lighting fixture's color rendering index, or CRI, how much of the spectrum it can reflect back to force us to decide how real we need a human to look. Proper filmmaking, needing that punch of incandescent light, could ignore any need to measure CRI. It flatters skin and it creates a simple unity on screen. Its only downsides are its massive power consumption and the lights are really hot. Even fluorescence, they filled in a lot of their spectral gaps. A big popular brand of lights that I've used in the past are Kino Flows, no relation to Ant Flow. And I don't want to leave out HMI lights. I'm not really going to talk about them, but they are a daylight balanced light. HMIs mixed with tungsten give you a really nice balance of tungsten, warm light, and daylight. But then came the Pandora's box moment and finally learned whether ignorance was bliss. It happened in two dates. The discovery of the blue LED in 1992 finally completed the holy trinity. The blue LED paired with the red and green LED gave us RGB light, opening Pandora's box so we could render nearly every color in LED light. It paved the way for incredible technology like the screen you're probably watching this video on with its RGB pixels, but it also paved the way for my nemesis, those clean white or bright white LEDs that crept their way into our neighbors and our families' homes. Not our homes, right? You wouldn't put clean white LEDs in your home. And this brings us to the Christmas light problem that I hinted at at the beginning. Alec over at Technology Connections has been perennially making videos about our shared hatred for LEDs, specifically Christmas LEDs. 
I hate them. Not just because they flicker like crazy, you'll often find me waving my hand under the LED lights at the hardware store trying to find a set that don't flicker. But more importantly, because they are what you call a line source emitter. This means if we go back to our spectrum chart, a blue LED is literally emitting only one slice of the spectrum a harsh, lonely spike of color, a classic blue incandescent Christmas light on the other hand, is essentially a gelled incandescent bulb, a warm full spectrum light pushing through a colored bulb. This filter or gel, as my friend and cinematographer Ian explained to me, filters the full spectrum of light towards blue. We perceive both an LED and a gelled incandescent bulb as blue, but in the filtered incandescent Christmas lights case, there is a soft roll off to the tone. This gel or filter can never fully cut out the rest of the spectrum. There's a very well-known company called Lee that makes gels, essentially colored filters for the filmmaking industry. And when you visit their site, they have what they call a mired shift graph, essentially assuming a full spectrum source. This graph shows what wavelengths are making it through any specific gel. And even though some really heavy gels cut a lot of the spectrum, certain colors are never fully eliminated. This roll off is so important. It's why one classic Christmas light can feel gentle and comforting, while a blue Christmas LED, to me at least, feels violent. And it took a while, but in 2015, Aerie released its Sky Panel S60C. This was filmmaking's first widely accepted full RGB light. Colored LEDs or neon lights, which are both line source emitters, weren't just background accents anymore. You could use this technology to light a human face in any color. Remember how deviating a little from the Kelvin scale made people look sick? Now we can go any direction without fussing with gels, without using thousands of watts of power. This whole area becomes your playground. And at the same time, the market was flooded with cheap, low quality RGB LEDs. I went to graphic design school and it makes me think about how throughout history, type designers would agonize over every curve and detail of a typeface, only to have the word processor allow every poster made to be some combination of Comic Sans and Papyrus. Papyrus! To repeat my favorite comment on here, too much blah, blah, blah. Here's my point. I don't want to be a gatekeeper. The problem is, that there's no gatekeeper. There's no one to say, no, that is not to spec. We now have three brutal line source emitters at our disposal to light any face. RGB dials have given every YouTuber and gamer the ability to line source emit blue LEDs into their face without the guardrails of gelled full spectrum light leaking through to soften the edges for our eyeballs sake. There is so much choice, we can do whatever we want. But with so much choice, the odds are without any knowledge, we will make the wrong choice. This bounty often doesn't actually free us. It more often makes us feel like we're wandering the desert instead of the thrill of going off a well-known beaten path. Understanding a visual language, a prehistoric color curved ingrained on us from the beginning of time has to mean something. It's why daylight bulbs aren't relaxing at night. Daylight means it's time to be up and productive. Why are you taking melatonin? It looks like noon in here. As technology advances and we deviate further and further from our roots in nature, neon lights as an accent color have all been replaced with a wild spectrum of color. We can choose anything. And in my case, any choice I make as a filmmaker, whether it's intentional or not, has an effect on my audience. Every choice you make in your home has an effect on your audience, your guests, your family, your lovers. In the not too distant past, the only choice, the default choice was the right choice. Now with no default choice, it's very easy to make the wrong choice. So my friend Ian, who I mentioned before is a cinematographer and a home builder. And he asked me if I knew why ceilings in homes are usually white. 
colored walls read better with a neutral reference point. This can extend even to filmmaking. Having a neutral point of reference makes a warm light feel warmer and a cool light feel cooler or a green light feel greener. Or even have the ultimate reference point, a human face. That is why my baseline, including right here, is always the Kelvin scale. A job that Ian and I recently shot together had a stylish cyan cast. The faces were always anchored in warm, natural light, but our highlight, the cyan, was used only as an accent. In fact, Ian chose to gel versus using an RGB mode. Overall, they've come a long way. They've improved so much. I shoot all of this channel on LEDs. The technological deficiencies that me and Ian complain about are mostly gone. Airy, which takes its time bringing products to market, knew that its first RGB light needed more than just RGB. It had an RGB plus white chipset in it. The more modern and much cheaper aperture light I'm lighting this video with has an RGB WW chipset which includes a warm and cool white filling even more of the spectral gaps. Other lights are adding lime and cyan chips to fill out the spectrum even more. Much like digital has surpassed film in many technical aspects, LEDs have caught up perceptibly at least to incandescent light. Big cinematographers have weathered this transition well because they fundamentally understand light and would simply say not up to spec. And it's hard for some of us without that experience, without that knowledge to make the right choice. So how do you avoid that gamer look and create a more balanced light? Step one is spectrum. Choose LEDs, especially RGB LEDs, with as many extra chips as you can afford. Sometimes they are called RGBWW or RGB++. These extra chipsets fill out the spectrum. They often have higher CRI values. Step two, if there's one thing that separates cinematographers from amateurs, it's subtlety. Actually look at your RGB fixtures as you play with the saturation in HSI mode. You can see those wider spectrum LEDs start to light up. Just putting your hand against them demonstrates that you're moving from a monochromatic spectral spike into a gentler gelled look that actually retains the spectrum and can reflect more appealing looking natural skin tone. An image recorded with a blue LED can never be color corrected. It is essentially black and white. It's monochromatic. The other parts of the spectrum are literally never reflected back because they're never emitted. If you want a blue backlight, don't go full saturation, retain some information. In person, it won't feel as vibrant, but our cameras are incredibly sensitive to it. This LED behind me right now, I think is at 15% saturation. And always have a white point, a point of reference in your image. Right now, that is my face. My face hopefully looks relatively healthy. And having that as a point of reference makes this blue look even bluer, even though it's only at 18% saturation. If this key light was cyan, everything would be cyan. It would be like wearing colored sunglasses. Your brain would try to bring it back to something more neutral and balanced. Rules are meant to be broken, but that presupposes that you know what the rules are. A broken rule should stand in contrast to an upheld rule. So, did the blue LED ruin filmmaking? Not really. The pros know what is to spec. But it did create more opportunities for YouTubers, young filmmakers, people like me, and homeowners to screw up. In LED's defense, they are an incredible improvement for our environment. With knowledge of the Kelvin scale, I can make informed decisions like my kitchen island LED lights that actually get warmer as you dim them just like an incandescent bulb would. They've actually added more color to our nighttime world. Sodium vapor lights, which let us home from our friends' homes at night, are line source emitters. That orange glow was a very narrow spectrum of light. As my town converted to LED, you can actually tell that the grass under the lights are green. This is my garage right here, and I have daylight balanced LED strips on the ceiling, and it's very stimulating to get projects done out here. I'm using this theory to my advantage. It's a little sad that we need to program every new digital thing to echo an analog of the past, but I guess that's the cost of progress. 
the LED has something to look back on for reference, a literal golden standard. Understanding light and its color, understanding that it has meaning is a powerful tool, whether it's in your storytelling or in your lighting of your home, in your seduction of a lover. We've been connected to this Kelvin scale since caveman times. And a little bit of knowledge, even with LEDs, can keep this line uninterrupted. Or just make your bedroom feel like a dental waiting area. I don't have to live there.